afternoon, everybody. And as always, it's indeed our greatest pleasure to welcome you to our monthly Be Smart webinar series. I can see people joining from KU. Paul Dottino, welcome, welcome. Um, anyone, if you would like to tell us where you're joining us from, kindly go to the chat. Tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, we host this monthly webinar series where we educate our customers and entrepreneurs on what they can do to empower their businesses. Last month, we focused on all the customer experience, excellence, and how to treat each client with dignity. In September, we learned on strategies that entrepreneurs and business leaders can use to inspire performance teams. If you want to see our previous amazing webinars, kindly visit our YouTube page, Springboard Capital, and get enlightened. Today's webinar will be speaking on optimizing online communication for business success. If you're a small business owner, you're likely proud and rightfully so, as you've done to earn this privilege of being your own boss. You've had been your own boss before. So we'll be thinking on ways to, to grow your business, your small business, and uh, so that you cannot ignore online communication communication as it forms an integral part of business practice. Get your pen and paper ready as we learn on how to purposefully invest in online communication for excellence and success. At this juncture, allow us to introduce the guest speaker, Kevin Maura. Over the last 12 years, Kevin has grown himself into a master's of craft in his trade with a passion of translating companies' marketing and communication problems into exciting practical solutions. He has built a name for himself in performance marketing. With global awards, for was working uh, with Kenyatta University, uh, National Youth Service, and Kenya Power. He has an MBA in finance, administration, accounting, marketing, master's of arts in uh, also multimedia design. He's very passionate about communication process. He's the founder and CEO of Creative Margin Limited, a creative agency that drives in automation data analytics deliver advertising campaigns at work therefore without much further ado kevin over to you thank you very much richard i think uh, at the end of this webinar we should have a discussion as to whether you're looking for a job as a promoter because i think that introduction is much better than, than i would have done by myself thank you thank you okay guys i, I think we'll just begin um i'm going to be honest and tell you uh, from the from the outset, the kind of uh, solutions or the kind of um, inputs that you might need for different businesses um, is different across the board. So everything you see here is a guide to start a conversation. Um, so let's begin. Um, you've already seen the introduction. Um, what you'll be seeing on your screen now is a, is a basic flow of the things that we are going to try and answer with the presentation today. So starting from, is it important to have your business online? Um, what reasons? Uh, would online communication be of interest to you? What platforms do businesses need to be on? Um, what activities work well? Um, how do you handle the challenges of online communication? Is it high risk? Is it low risk? Um, does one outsource or keep it in-house? Which one works the best? Uh, what are the do's and don'ts of online communication? And what have we learned from COVID? Now, uh, at this point, uh, I think we're going to have a Q&A, which will add quite a bit of value to those of you who want to participate. You might have a solution that works for one company, but won't work for a company in the same industry uh, the same way. So it's really important that if you're ever looking to get online, um, have a discussion uh, at first with someone who will give you genuine feedback uh, that will allow you to know the right way to go. Okay, is being online important? The answer is yes. Uh, most of you know that this day and age, uh, connectivity and Wi-Fi is more of a basic need than eating. Yeah, um, it's very it's very difficult for you to imagine uh, going to leaving your house and going to a separate location, whether it's a supermarket or or town or or visiting a family friend or who, who you've never been to their house before without your phone. So you, being online is extremely critically important uh, for businesses because uh, everybody is there now. I think penetration for connectivity in Kenya is a ridiculous number. I think it's in the 90s now, 90 93 percent is very, very, very high. Uh, and uh, if you're not in that space, even if you're operating at, um, at a local or neighborhood level, uh, you're really losing out on customers who would have found you without having to uh, put in too much money towards uh, reaching them. So definitely the answer is yes. However, the purpose and reason for being online varies widely depending on several things. So the first thing is your type of business, right? If um, we are in the business of let's say creating steel bars for manufacturing i mean or for for construction maybe you don't want to be putting ads on tv telling people about the types of steel bars that you have uh, but you would want to find a way to reach uh, construction uh, businesses directly and inform them of the kind of services that you have on the other hand 
um, if you have a new milk product in the market and a lot of people need to hear about it and know why it's different from the current ones in the market, then maybe the way you use your Facebook or TikTok, God forbid, um, would actually be much more different compared to someone who is making steel bars. Okay, how often do you engage with your customers? Um, using the same example for the, um, for the construction supplies, when you're dealing with someone who is building, um, who is doing a lot of construction, you're probably going to deal with them uh, once, twice a year. However, um, if you're in the service industry, for example, uh, banking uh, or a restaurant, you probably will deal with your customers a lot more so the frequency with which you engage with them should will also advise um, which platforms to use and how to use them. Um, the next one is, do you have an opportunity for e-commerce? Um, is it possible for you to increase your revenues or your sales uh, by doing one or two things online? And the, the one that I would like to touch on uh, here at the end is, do you need data? Now, um, data is important to everything. Um, even the attendance of this uh, webinar is advised by data collected by each individual. So one, um, I know what this, what this data is about. I know what this webinar is about. I know what time it's going to happen. And I believe that attending it is worth my time. So what happens if you were to widen the scope of data that is making you uh, make certain decisions in your business? Um, what if you know that there are 100 people holding their money in their wallet, waiting to give it to you, uh, and they are all on TikTok. Would you not be interested uh, to approach them? So it sounds, I've, I've used TikTok specifically because it's new and it's, 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 it's actually very hard to understand, uh, even for ourselves. Uh, maybe the audience that's there is also um, not mature or ready to, to do transactions, but if you're told that you have 100 customers willing to pay today, I'm sure you'll be opening a page within the next five minutes. So that brings us now to platforms, okay? Um, once you're clear on the reason um, that you're embracing uh, to use online communication to add value to your business, the next step is to identify the platform that will deliver your goals and objectives. Most people will jump to social media when they think of online. Um, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but it's really critical that you understand how to use it. So as I explained to you these platforms, uh, I'm going to give you some industry secrets you might not know by, with how they work. Now, anybody who comes to me and wants to go online, the first thing I tell them to do is create a website. And the only reason um, this is critically important is because the website is yours and you can change it as you see fit and you can change it very quickly. So consider a, a website to be a house that you have built and own for yourself. Consider everything else as a place you're renting, right? And the reason for this is anybody who has tried to use things like social media, which is the next one, or sales, engagement, or PR, one thing you'll notice is that um, for anything that you want that has impact on social media, you have to pay. So they'll tell you if you want X number of engagements, if you want X number of replies, X number of shares, you have to pay this amount of money. Now, that's well and good because more often than not, they do have a good return on investment. The only thing is the moment you stop paying, you have absolutely no power on that platform simply because it's not yours. The next thing is video. I've separated social and video um, because of something in our business we call um, state of mind. Um, I'll give you an example with, uh, again, I'll use the, the guy who's manufacturing steel bars simply because it's a very hard thing I, I, I can I imagine to sell. Um, this guy who is making steel bars, if he wants to put out um, a safety notice as to why using this type of steel is more important than using this type of steel to prevent collapse of buildings. If this guy puts this video on TikTok, it won't get as much traction as if he was to put it on Twitter, for example, because Someone who is on Twitter and what they're reading and the way they're accepting this information is very different than someone who is viewing um, humorous stuff on TikTok. So it's really important to understand state of mind for the audience um, when you think about your goals and objectives. If you want to make people laugh, it's a different platform. If you want people to actually take time to think about what you're saying, it's a different platform. So YouTube and TikTok are commanding viewership globally um, with different audiences. Uh, they, are, they are owned by separate companies. So you see they keep trying to copy each other on what works and what doesn't. But one thing that we've come to see in the past for sure is with the drop of cost of data globally, 
the acceptance of a video as a communication channel has grown um is growing exponentially so what this means is that people are more willing to watch a video than read uh three pages of whatever it is you're talking about so video is super critical um i would like to remove the fear of the cost of video nowadays um, i'm sure everybody on this uh, call has a phone that can take a video that would be acceptable on any of these platforms um not only that but a lot of the guys who are now online value authenticity of a high production especially when you're doing something regarding communication now separate communication and entertainment um you're not going to do um some a communication about your business that at the level of a marvel movie right as long as it's authentic as long as um it actually adds value to the person who's watching the video then you don't need steven spielberg to make the video for you uh, and finally uh, i'll mention chat okay uh, one of the stats i'll tell you now is that chat platforms have more users than any social media platform across the board so when i say chat i'm talking about uh, whatsapp telegram wechat for those of you who are adventurers um or those of you who deal with china uh all those chat platforms are bigger than any of the others you know so whatsapp is actually bigger for facebook than facebook is for facebook okay so chat also cuts across all ages um 10 years ago you might have thought it impossible to have sent an sms to your grandma or your auntie nowadays it's a no brainer they're probably even sending you memes probably memes that you saw last month but they are still sending them okay activities that might work well online um this is really important and it's really it's really peculiar to each type of business and I, i use the word peculiar because of the example i'm going to show you later so most people would like to go online because they want to increase their reach or how much money they're making in their business which is well and good um there's nothing wrong with making more money but um previously people used to see that marketing and sales were separate entities so you'd actually have someone who does sales and someone who does marketing and the person who did, who did marketing had a, had an amazing time because all he had to do was spend money to make sure the business was was visible now the sales guy used to have a very crazy headache to get these people to to actually come and purchase something now with online and it has really has made this barrier very hard to see because you tend to be selling at the same time you're speaking so there is no moving from one end to the other over a period of time it's possible to get people who uh, are sent a flash sale by jumia right now and they and they purchase but not everybody who gets it purchases so what happens when you get that notification for black friday is you know that this thing is happening but at the same time someone else has received it and completed the transaction so was that a sales or a marketing activity it's both okay finally then we have a customer experience um it's possible to be in a business that doesn't require you to sell online however uh giving your customers a way to engage with you could be just as if not more important so um you need you can you can think about services like uh hospitals for example um you're not it's the telemedicine and online consultation is a new thing but you're not going to perform a surgery or a or a basic procedure on someone online however um you do see hospitals doing online communication why is that uh they they have a need for top of mind awareness and they have a need for uh communicating with people about you know health benefits and things they can do in their life and covid as a, as a very good example so um another thing you can do online is data mining now i'm not i don't want you to think of data mining as nasa or the fbi um simple things like understanding the average age of your audience um what they like um what they think about you is considered data mining and that information is always important um and it's always important to have it new and fresh so things like um my customers thought i was expensive in january but uh in august they don't think i'm expensive that the price is the same why is that um it could be something about the stage in their life it could be something about uh the year that the time of year all that information is important in terms of how you structure your business um so simple things like email responders uh, are actually good enough to collect information are people responding are people reading them are people opening them are they even receiving um things like uh, customer profiling um if you send a lot of emails and you know that there is this customer who keeps opening and reading them the next time you want to sell something that's the person you approach first okay 
Um, there's an opportunity for businesses of all types and sizes uh, for data mining. So don't think at the NASA level. Hopefully, you'll eventually get there. But it's always good to start from somewhere. Finally, there's brand management. Now, online PR uh, is really, really important. If you don't do it, people will do it for you. Um, developing what is called a persona and managing how your brand is perceived is easily done using online platforms because you don't have to schedule an interview on radio or TV like it used to be before. So you'll find that managing what we call a persona um, can be really critical to your business uh, long term. So I'm going to give you an example of a persona in the next few slides. Now, what this means is if, if you think about your business as a, as, a, as a human being, what kind of person will it be? Is it going to be an 80-year-old man who has been in this world for so long and knows everything and speaks with a point of authority? Is it going to be someone who is young and fun, like the way Cook represent themselves? Is it going to be somebody who is highly educated and knowledgeable about uh, finance, like a stockbroker would be? So you don't want someone who is your, managing your, your stock control to be making jokes every day, because you don't think this person is serious about managing your money. So the way they portray themselves, the guy might be the funniest person in real life, but the way you portray yourself online is what we call a persona. It might not necessarily be who, who, how the business is, but it has to be something that is relatable and beneficial uh, to the people who are receiving the information, which is your customers and potential customers. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a, a company in America called Wendy's. Uh, Wendy's uh, is a fast food restaurant. Right. So what happens when you're a small fast food restaurant trying to stand out when compared to global entities like McDonald's and Burger King who command larger market share in your environment? And the simple answer is you use your small nature to create a real relationship with your real customers. So Wendy's is not looking to take over the world. What they are trying to do is to make sure that the customers who like them stay their customers and tell their friends about them and eventually convert them to be customers. So they don't, they don't, they're not aiming for 50% market share. They're comfortable with the 20 and the 25. What they did is they used the fact that they are small to do things the big guys couldn't do. So I'm gonna show you a few messages that they posted on Twitter um, on how they engaged with their audience. So this is a question from one of their followers. Can you find me the nearest McDonald's? And Wendy's responds with an image of a trash can. Okay, show you another one. Wendy's, my friend wants to go to McDonald's. What should I tell him? Find new friends. If I don't have a Wendy's at my location, what do I do? Another potential customer, move. Wendy's, your food is trash. This is now what they call keyboard warriors or haters online. No, your opinion is though. So you can see how Wendy's is responding. They are not concerned about PR or the corporate image that big businesses like McDonald's or Coca-Cola would do. They, there's no way these big businesses would be able to respond to their customers like this. And you'll be surprised the result of this was I think uh, a 1,200% growth in their following and uh, a lot of positivity, what they call positive sentiment. Uh, positive sentiment is the measure of how many nice things are said about you versus how many bad things are said about you online. So theirs went through the roof. Yet they were responding to people the way they would respond to them as if they were the same age. Uh, Wendy's, what should I get from McDonald's? Directions to the nearest Wendy's. So they set up a persona and you'll see the way they are talking wasn't come and get a burger for $2 or come and uh, our, there's, we now have a new shop in this place. They were simply setting up a strategy that was purely to engage with their customers in a way that they'd find interesting and funny and it ended up working out for them. So um, when you look at uh, return on investment with your online communication, um, what you see below here is uh, things that you need to put down, which we call criti three critical pillars that will give you a foundation that will aid with your ROI goals. Now, the example um, below was used for specifically for customer care. Um, if you remember at the beginning of this webinar, I mentioned you need to define why you're going online and what you need from it. 
before you get to this stage. So I'll, I'll show you uh, basically what these things um, come together to form. Um, so the first one is persona. I've just explained you to you persona. So looking at Wendy's, uh, they looked at um, if the business was a human being, what does he or she look like? Um, what does he do for a living? Um, where does she shop? Things like that. And it's really important to go very detailed into this persona. Where did they study? Um, what languages do they speak? So on and so forth. Because that once that's written down, you're, it's very easy to give someone else to execute your social media on, on your behalf. Um, the next thing is what are your core ideals? So um, in your business itself, what do you value the most? And what is it that has made your business get to where it is today? Is it uh, honesty, openness? Is it, um, is it being uh, sharp or witty or snarky like Wendy are? Is it being real? Uh, and so on and so forth. And then we also must always look at sustainability and scalability. If we start doing something like this and we become bigger, can it continue growing with us? Or is it something that will only work for three months and then have to be put in the bin? And once you look at things, uh, things those it items that we call our pillars, you, you end up with something which is called a strategic foundation. And that now advises um, how you're going to go online and what kind of ROI you'll be aiming for. Now, before I give the next case study, which was very good on ROI, uh, I'd like to apologize for anybody who has bought land from PRC. Apparently, us guys did our job too well when we were handling uh, their business. So property reality company, um, property reality company was um, was get, getting very famous because of using traditional advertising to sell land, and uh, particularly through radio. So they came, they got to a point where they were growing um, so fast that it wasn't possible to to retain the kind of cost the radio was costing them. So it it was once a day, came twice a day, became five times. No, once a day, no, once a week, twice a week times a week eventually they were there the whole morning and those of you who might have dealt with the radio will know that 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 cost can quickly skyrocket from um 30 000 for one ad to one to two million a week so it became unsustainable and they started wondering um is there a better way to to get to our audiences and convince them to buy property uh without having to do it the manual way so that they came to us for a solution and what we found was that the entire business did not believe online could work because they have never seen someone um, buy land without physically visiting it and walking around it and measuring uh, the acres with their own two feet. So we challenged them on this and we told them it's possible that it's true, people won't buy online, but it's also possible that only the people you've spoken to won't buy it online. How about the guys who are already there? Let's see what they're going to say about it. So they were really skeptical and we told them what we normally tell most of our customers. Um, data doesn't lie. And if you follow the numbers, it's very easy to make decisions. Uh, so we showed them the opportunity to purchase and we told them, let's do this. We know how much you're spending on radio. Give us a quarter of what you're spending and see if it works. If it works, we move on. If it doesn't work, we stop. So they agreed to this. So we created an online advertising plan that was focused on collecting data on individuals, not, not, not to, to, to avoid privacy. Uh, we are really, we're really serious about privacy in our business because it will mean my business will collapse. But to see how we can get someone interested and follow up until they actually make an eventual purchase along what you call the marketing funnel. So I'm going to show you the way we normally report to our customers. And if you are to deal with anybody who tells you about communication, please make sure they speak to you the same way. Um, there's this, we call this um, the one page report. I'll just take you through it really slowly. Um, it's not very complicated. So at the top left, we have what we call the product value. So this was the price of each piece of land that PRC was selling. Next, we have how much money they gave us to do this job. Now, this 700 um, was inclusive of very many things. The first thing was strategy, social media, online ads, um, actual videos. There was a lot of things we did, but we separated how much we are spending in advertising compared to how much uh, we were doing for every other, every other activity, which was almost half of the amount that they were spending with us. That being said, that amount of money um, is going to get you about uh, 30 seconds uh, in the news today at seven o'clock or nine o'clock once. Um, for, for, for us, this lasted one month on social media. And what were the results? On the, on the top middle, you will see something that, is, that we call leads. Now, 234 people um, 
followed this ad and said, I am interested in looking at this piece of property. And out of those 234, 26 people actually purchased. So what does that mean? That means um, if you do the 234 times the value of the land, the potential value of money they could have got was 117 million. But the actual money they got was 13 million, right? They got 13 million from giving us 700K. Do you know what happens with customers when they follow the numbers? Right now, all of you are interested in what we did, yet I've not shown you anything pretty. There's no images, there's no videos, there's no photos. But these are the numbers of what happened once you try to do something from a data approach. If, you, if, if we spoke to the CEO and we told him that we danced on the street in clown outfits, he wouldn't care as long as the results were not uh, damaging to the brand and they brought in customers. So what happens with our customers um, once they see these results? Every single time without fail, the budget increases. More often than not, it's double. So you'll notice that this is now a second property. They increased how much they are spending. They increased how much money they got back. Now, this is not infinite. It's not that if you decide today to sell your kidney and get 5 million to spend on advertising that will come back. Um, what we always advise customers is do a test with what you have, find out what works, and eventually you'll get to what is called a saturation point, a point at which the amount of money you're putting in makes sense because of the amount of money that's coming back. We had a similar experience with uh, Moko Home and Living. Um, Moko um, was originally started as a digital business and they used to sell mattresses only. Now, the thing about mattresses is um, you don't sell mattresses every week. If someone buys a mattress, they're probably not going to replace it for another five to ten years even, depending on how how much care they have for their back. But um, they needed to get to a popular... Another thing about Moko is that they are very focused on being the most affordable mattress in the market. So their, um, um, their, their prices are extremely reasonable and they, they are targeting a, a demographic that the Victoria Furnitures and everybody else is not targeting for. Targeting. But when they started, these guys were not very open with online purchases, right? So if you, if you go and if you visit... A, a store owned by these guys. There is no furniture at all. Uh, there is a few chairs, a bed, and some some cushions. And what they do is they take your details, um, find out uh, where you live, and tell you that within seven days a mattress will be delivered to your house. So the, the, we have we happen to get um, a hold of these guys as customers um, just before COVID hit, which completely helped with um, the use of of, of online as a, as a sales platform. So we got a social media campaign around the fact that their costs are the lowest in the market, and we elevated their audience to be comfortable to make purchases online. Now that phrase "elevate your audience" is really 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 important. I've spoken to people who do work like um let's say hardware sale for example and they say uh nobody is going to even consider buying no one is going to consider buying lumber or nails online and the problem with that kind of approach is you're making a judgment call on your audience without understanding um what their actual problems are number one number two not everybody knows where your shop is so when we say elevate your audience we always tell our customers to play at a level that their customers want to be in right so if you think your customers might be a bit afraid of online, but would try it. By all means, make that process very easy for them. Make them understand that you are very comfortable in that space and lift them up. A lot of uh, businesses, when it comes to communication, try to lower. So there's these things they do, like um, they try to put sheng in the way they speak, which is fine for certain brands. They try to do broken English again, also fine for certain brands, depends on what you're selling. But not everybody can do it. If you are a finance institution trying to get people to live better lives, then speak to them as if you are actually lifting them up. Don't don't go, don't don't put yourself at a point where you believe is, is beneath where your customers should be. So I'll move on to communication risks. Obviously, uh, nothing is perfect. There are risks to going online, but they are possible to mitigate. Popular risks um, are listed below, but this is not the full list of them, but they are quite popular. So the first one is negative PR. Uh, people are often very idle online and negative stories spread faster than positive stories. Uh, I, want to tell you story, I want to tell you a story about negative PR. The thing we learned about people who talk badly online is that they are idle, to be honest. Um, if you have a problem with your bank, if you, if you went to your bank app and found out that you 
your balance is zero. I promise you, you're not going to go to Twitter to complain. You're going to go to the bank or call them and find a solution and find out why this is an issue. Now, possibly later, there might have been a mistake on their end and then you see someone else has that mistake. You will go online and complain that even you, you had that problem. But you see, at that point, you don't. You're just idle. If you if you understand that, then you start realizing that responding to everybody online who is making noise uh, adds absolutely no value to your business. People who are seeking a solution do not come with insults. They will say, I have this problem. Can you assist? And those are the ones you respond to. Eventually, over time, your negative PR disappears. Uh, a lot of people think it's a, it's a joke when I tell them someone is tell, stop saying something bad about you, ignore it. It normally ends. Uh, things don't trend for more than three days. Next is data security. Once you put information online, it's critical to have a decent investment in security to protect you and your customer data. So if there's any situation where you might be collecting information of any type, names, phone numbers, locations, etc., you would want to look into how to secure it um, as often as possible. Ownership is a, is a risk. Uh, investing in platforms owned by other individuals can put you at a risk as you're not in 100% control. What does this mean? I think in September of this year, I think Google and Facebook went down for like six hours and there was a mass panic around the world. Yet, if you were doing all your sales on your website, it would not have been a headache for you, right? So the fact that it's not in your control is a very, very huge risk. So be very careful how you split your resources between things you own and things you don't own. And finally, conversions. Um, for some businesses, uh, the investment required to increase awareness may not be rapid or consistent. So you might find yourself spending money now for you to eventually get uh, results a lot later down the line. Okay, another question that's often asked, do we in-house or outsource? Um, in-housing allows you to have clear brand uh, representation. The person who is talking about it works in the business and they know what they're talking about. You can directly communicate with customers. Um, if someone asks for something, you can respond immediately without having to seek uh, a response from a third party. Um, and you can easily uh, start do better strategy and planning and decision making. So if the person who is doing your online communication is part of your strategic meeting, they'll give a lot more, a, a lot better insights on how to, how to move the business forward. Outsourcing though uh, does help with getting a higher level of expertise. They're going to deal with someone who does this day in, day out, and they'll be a lot more efficient at doing it. Uh, the other really powerful thing is an outside opinion or market insight. There are so many instances where we've learned from something we've done for government that works for someone who has a shop uh, in the back streets of Westlands. So you, you being internal, you'll be you'll only learn from things that are within your business. If you deal with someone who has who is dealing with several other industries, you'll learn a lot from their knowledge of the other industries. Access to tools is standard because we have to subscribe to a lot of tools that would be very expensive for one one business to to do for themselves. So the biggest bit of advice I would I would give any of my customers is grow to what we call a hybrid model. The hybrid model is a mix of outsourcing and in-housing. The only thing you do is separate the roles. So the person who is inside has a, has roles that are specific and critical to the success of your business. The person who is outside has a role that is mid to low level in terms of the success of your business. So what this means is you select the most critical function. And if that function is absolutely important to your day-to-day, -day, then you put that in-house. Then what you do is seek strategic advice from an expert. Now, strategic advice doesn't happen every day. You might need an expert to come in once a month, even once a quarter, to tell you if this is happening the right way or what you can do to change and, and to advise the people who are internal. Next is engaging an expert in a critical service. So we need you guys to create for us a video. And the, the only video experience I have is selfies and TikTok videos. Come in and do this for us and then go away once you're done. Nominate internal staff to take up critical tasks, always promote from within, and then retain external services for non-critical tasks. Just to give you an example, um, there's once we dealt with Jubilee Insurance, they were tired of paying uh, creative agencies to, sorry guys, I, I want to tell you this story, so I don't want you to be reading. They want to pay advertising agencies to do their communication for them. So they hired a huge team, I think 20 people, to start doing all their material in-house. So that's their social media, their print, their even flyers, uh, brochures, so on and so forth. This worked very well for a while, for about six months before they came back knocking. And they had a very interesting problem. The people in their team were all professionals in what they did. The only thing is because every day they were exposed to insurance, 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 their minds started becoming stale in terms of ideas. So with creative guys, it's very hard to get them to do something consistently for a very long time. Even for us, every three 
three to six months, we change the teams that are working on different customers just to get in fresh ideas and different things to do for them. So this is one big issue with trying to do everything internally. Eventually, at some point, we'll get what we call burnout and the, the, the ideas will now become either repetitive or stale. So this is an experience that um, that Jubilee Insurance had. And if you are to speak to them now, they will be fully they will be fully supportive of the, of the hybrid model. What they do now is customer care and social media is handled internally, especially with issues regarding claims, new products. But when it comes to uh, getting people to understand, so let's say uh, sales or marketing, it's outsourced to another service, to another business. Do's and don'ts. Uh, do's do not uh, build from scratch. If things already exist, don't believe you have to create the, the, a website from nothing. There are very, very basic things that you can use to, to get online quickly. Uh, create professional content. Do not take shortcuts. Uh, take pride in the work you're going to do when you put it online. Make sure it's at the highest level at all times. Market your core money-making services. Begin with the things that are going to give you money to allow you to grow and use data to improve your products and services. The don'ts, uh, don't forget what's important to your audience. Don't go there and talk to people about things that you like, uh, ignoring what they like. Uh, skip your product a focus to pander to audiences. So don't talk about your product every five minutes. Always engage with your customers and, and, and even if it's a conversation about how their weekend was, it might be a lot more powerful than telling them the cost of whatever it is you're selling. Don't neglect to add value to each customer's experience uh, in support of the previous point and do not give up on your original goals. So it's really important to do a test for yourself as to where you are compared to where you began and where you want to achieve, where, where you want to reach. Uh, learnings from COVID, I see we're almost done to Q&A. Well, COVID was, uh, was a learning for everybody. Uh, for the From the communication side of things, we experienced a very crazy hit because people's communication and marketing budgets were the first ones to be stopped when people didn't know whether they'll be alive uh, in the next few in the next few months. But other learnings uh, we experienced were things like remote teamwork. Uh, people were able to transition from physical to virtual meetings very easily. It allowed people to work uh, fairly quickly. I remember the, the client service team, uh, the, the first thing they said is they, they liked that they didn't have to be in traffic for three hours for a 15-minute meeting uh, with their customers. So remote teamwork has been amazing for, for communication um, businesses. And even for, for those who are averse to adapting online platforms like what we are doing today. Uh, E-commerce, a lot of uh, businesses, a lot of people became open to buying things online and a lot of customers, a lot of businesses started trying to practice and see if people to be purchasing their products. I remember at some point even Farmers Choice was doing it directly. Um, relationship building was big. Brands were tasked to be to really with a deeper level with the audiences over and above sales. So the moment you are deemed non-critical uh, to, to customers, it, it immediately impacted your bottom line during COVID. So you had to find another way to engage with them and keep them interested in your product so that when you become critical again, they'll come back to you. And finally, there was cost efficiency. So the previous three points and other factors lead to cost-efficient ways to engage with internal and external audiences. Once you learn all these things, uh, the information you gather allows you to make better decisions that may, that reduce your cost in, in reaching audiences and help you get the right ones who will eventually become customers. And now, hand over for the Q&A. Mr. Moderator, idea. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, how an enlightening session. We are all become digital marketers from that session. I believe whichever profession or whichever business you own, you can now, you have the tools, you have the skills to go out there and market. You've heard about how communication is, forms the basic necessities of everyone's life. And it's not surprising that online communication is getting more and more popular than traditional communication. So uh, as, we wait, uh, as we go to the next section of Q&A, kindly post your uh, questions in the chat. And we really appreciate you, Kev Kevin, for this enlightening session. So as you've heard about uh, the importance, such platforms are uh, important, like the website. Have you heard about the website? The website, you should use it as a house. Whatever you think, those things that you, you want it in your house, just you want to make sure they're looking glamorous looking good so your web website can look so glamorous you should make it more glamorous uh social media you've heard about social media uh there are people who right now are uh, tweeting and uh, face using facebook as a tool to market their products videos you've heard about how you should use uh videos platform because right now we have got into an age where videos have become 80 percent of uh, your time you're using uh, to watch videos and uh, learn from the from them and especially even tiktok the new platform that is coming on is so much trending so you have dance videos you have enlightening uh, educational videos use the use it and lastly about chats uh, i think we've all heard about chats and uh if you're talking to your customers you should always have a way
way to engage your customers. I'm sure they would like to reach to reach out to you on WhatsApp. So ensure that you have a platform they can reach out to you. So uh, we, as we go to the question and, ans uh, and uh, answers, uh, we'll start with the first question from Paul Ocheno. When does responses sound negative and rude? Is it about the target audience or decorum? Kevin? That's a very good question. Rude would be, ne negative is, is fairly clear, but rude would be a matter of perspective. There are some people who would call um, something that's rude, honest or straight, but that's that's drawing away of away from Wendy's actual strategy. Wendy's strategy was to stand out. So if one of the pillars that they had from standing out was being, let's say, always positive, then for you to stand out, you could put a bit of negative in your communication and with minimum um, investment, have a much bigger impact than your bigger competitors who are putting in a lot more money. So for them, it was a strategic decision to completely uh, break the mold of what is acceptable online. And to be honest, Honest, it could have backfired but for them it worked simply because they understood that online trolls prefer negative information to positive information and I'll, I'll tell you i'll give you a fact here locally when there was an unfortunate terrorist attack at westgate that incident was uh, trending online every day and for two days after now the thing is immediately after uh, uh, was the end of that event i put in quite a bit of money to get people to to donate blood uh, for the victims of that event. And Safaricom trended for six hours. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how good it is that you're going to put online. Negative stories will always be more interesting than positive ones. I thank you, Kevin. I think it's important to, as you've said, to ensure that you have strategies that work for you. But, and those strategies work for your audiences. So on to the next question you've asked. Uh, we have one from Caroline Taburu. Very insightful presentation. Do we have to be on all platforms? They are new and emerging, deep and trendy channels coming up every day? For all platforms, uh, the answer is no. However, um, I will tell you that it's it's possible that you might not know the right one immediately. So you, you might want to try them all at the beginning. And eventually what happens is you'll see a response on one of them that is better or more efficient or just different. So let's say you find that on Facebook, uh, your customers are really responding to memes relevant to your business, but on Twitter, they are more interested in getting a link to purchase. So what happens is, yes, you're on several platforms, but you're using them for different things. So you don't do the same thing on each of them, and you don't have to be there if it adds absolutely no value to you. So it's, it's, a, it's more of a learning process. What I would advise if you are concerned about many channels is try. try Try and try, and then and then follow the one that gives the results that you're after with your goals. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I think it's very important that you said to ensure that you're on platforms that work for you, and uh, you concentrate on the one that is bringing uh, good results and bring leads and having you have inquiries, as you've said. Another question is from Collins Aligula. What do you think will be the net effect of the new tax policies on online business? Will it increase the government's revenue or chase away business startups? Okay, so the new tax policies. Uh, you business money entrepreneurs were used to dealing with KRA. The change was immediate, it was automatic. So a lot of um, the multinationals, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, all those guys who you need to pay to do your advertising online, the, the tax uh, cutoff came in overnight. The moment the, the bill was passed, the next day, all the bills coming out from those platforms had tax and they're submitting the tax. So it doesn't affect us immediately. Who it might affect though, is um, if you're doing e-commerce and you need to justify your sales, or if you're an individual who is uh, selling, you know, shoes uh, from their house, uh, those guys might have a bit of a problem in terms of um, in terms of justifying their spending. About chasing uh, business startups, um, you'll be surprised that startups, uh, people who do startups and funding for startups, are always inclined with the law, very much so, because the risk to their investment is very high if they don't follow the rules. So I would be surprised if it chased startups, uh, Kenya specifically, Kenya specifically has a very very good reputation for being ahead of the curve uh, with online and to be honest i think the government knows that and took advantage uh, to impose those tax on people who are, are participating online if you were to do it in a country that is less developed and less advanced than us it might be a problem but for kenya i, I highly doubt it okay thank you thank you kevin We'll take up one last question uh, from Eustace SL. Is it advisable to pay influencers who ad advertise for similar products as yours 
to promote your business online? Yes. The thing about um, influencers is credibility. So if someone uh, says that they like eating chicken and it's it's true in their past, you see that they like eating chicken. And one day they say they had chicken at Art Cafe, the next day they had chicken at Kenchi or at uh, or KFC, then the, the story is believable, right? That's number one. However, competing with um, your, I mean, focusing on your competitors is the wrong way to approach influencers, simply because unless that person is your employee, you will not pay them forever. Um, the best thing to do with influencers is do what we call performance contract. Um, it's not as complicated as, as, as you might believe. Um, what it basically means is that I need you to promote this product for me, and I'm going to give you a way to track your impact. And that could be as simple as giving them a link that is specific to them. And you tell them that for every person who clicks this link, regardless of how it comes, I will pay you X amount of money. Now, what happens there is you get immediate return for your cash without having to wait and see if this person is going to influence people to buy it eventually, right? So you can do it in the light way, which is awareness. How many people will you drive to see my product? And the hard way, how many people will you drive to eventually make a purchase? And then I will give you a cut of that purchase. Now, I'll tell you right now, influencers hate that. Influencers hate it because they know it is that they were they, they, they used to sell a lot of hot air uh, because these have a lot of followers, a lot of fake followers on that, on that note. But once you get someone who will actually do a performance contract with you, then you'll have someone who believes in what you're doing and will actually put in the work. Thank you, Kevin. I, I think we've seen how influencers are, are changing uh, the way of marketing. And uh, if you give them the right KPIs and track the, the, their performance, it will help your business, as you've said. So we are getting to the conclusion. And thank you so much, Kevin, for your time and for this informative discussion about online communication. If you don't mind, could we share this presentation to our audience today? By all means. And as I said at the beginning, consult a professional. Advice is free. I think that has been shared on the chat, put in your full names uh, that are chat and then we'll send you the presentation. Now, Springboard Capital is a lending institution. We lend to all your needs, including business capital, info duty, financing, and uh, purchasing assets, and many more. So why Springboard Capital, you ask? We are very customer friendly. We structure our solutions to cater for your needs. We give you flexible repayment period, and we are here to empower you and find your dreams. Without much, much taking of your time, Kevin, you fill us with a very full plate this last hour, though it's now time to say goodbye. So see you next time and have a good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. You have a good day, everyone.